because um, variational principles allow us to encode symmetry in a transparent way. Okay. So, um, so in fact, let's begin with the, the case of Lorentz symmetry. So for example, uh, we dealt with the case where our Lagrangian was a function of uh, phi and its first derivative, okay? And uh, we want to see that um, if L itself is a Lorentz scalar, then the Euler-Lagrange uh, uh, equations uh, are well, also Lorentz uh, invariant. That's the first example that we want to do. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing is that so Euler Lagrange simply means that uh, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field is equal to the divergence, the space-time divergence of the derivative of the same Lagrangian with respect to the uh, derivative of uh, the field. So, um, uh, in fact, the method, sorry, is already a scalar. It's already a Lorentz scalar, which I hope is clear, uh, because the Lagrangian is a scalar, the scalar field is a scalar. Do you guys mind if you would help me turn on the AC? Sorry, I'm just a little bit um, Thank you. Um, uh, so the only thing to do is uh, actually to figure out how does this guy transform, right? So we know how the derivative transforms. But the question is, does this guy transform in the right way? Thank you. Um, so, so that's actually the um, key point here. And fortunately, we can actually see it explicitly. Um, and here's how we do it. Right? So the first thing is that we know that the derivative uh, of the scalar, so with respect to x, uh, contracted with the Jacobian, is going to give you, in fact, the derivative with respect to uh, mu prime, which I'm going to just denote as uh, x. It's an x prime, this means x prime mu, right? But I'm going to Short, short, uh, short-handed as partial mu prime, and uh, so if I substitute 
uh, all the definitions for x in terms of x prime, then in fact this would be a uh, partial new prime of x prime in fact. Right? And so so we certainly know, in other words, we certainly know how the derivative transform. So let's now in fact ask the question, how does the uh, derivative of the Lagrangian itself transform? So the thing is, remember, this is a scalar. So uh, in particular, if you want to know how does this guy transform, then uh, it's just basically like a chain group, right? It's a chain group. So you take, you treat this like a variable, and then you take the, uh, uh, what do I call it now? That's yeah, mu prime, phi x prime, divided by, a d of this guy with respect to d of alpha alpha prime uh, sorry of alpha and then you can now write it as d of partial mu prime phi x prime okay so there's a sum over mu here uh, because we're doing a change of variables, right? Just think of this as like a, a variable. But we can do this because of this, right? We in fact know that this in fact implies, uh, sorry, this way, uh, this in fact implies that if you take a derivative of this guy with respect to that, you get
that is constant, as we can see that we don't need to write down the number, we can just use the fact that Jacobians, the two Jacobians are inverses of each other. So, so here we go, right? So it's partial mu prime, and then this is partial x prime mu dx alpha. Okay. Okay, I'm just giving some space because this is my d, this is my d alpha. And then we've shown that um, the derivative of the Lagrangian itself also transforms as the following, right? It's, uh, it's actually x prime nu dx alpha. Okay, I changed my variables to nu here because uh, there's a sum over mu here, but that sum over mu is not the same as the sum over mu here. So there's a mu, there's a nu here. Uh, but, but the alpha is the same because there's an alpha here. But this is exactly where I'm going to use the uh, transformation that um, uh, this is uh, just the inverse transformation of each other. So this is Kronecker mu right, and partial mu prime, d l d nu prime phi of x prime. And therefore this is equals to partial mu prime d l d mu prime phi of x prime. And this is exactly what we mean by a Lorentz scalar, right? It takes the same form, uh, the derivatives take the same form in whatever inertial frame you are, and the rest of the, rest of the uh, functional form, you just plug in x for x prime. Right? That's basically what it means. So therefore, uh, we have shown that this guy in the x frame takes this form, and in the x prime frame, we'll just take dl d phi, but now in terms of x prime, it's actually partial mu prime, dl d mu prime, x prime. Okay. ultimately what we want, right? Um, at least at the classical level, um, uh, the equations of motion are what we want. Right? We, we need to solve a bunch of partial differential equations. And uh, uh, so what you see is that the Lorentz, the Lagrangian gives you a short hand to guarantee uh, covariance. Yeah. So gen more generally, covariance is what they're after. So in fact, um, let's see it for the Maxwell's equations. Okay. So scalar is the first example, but let's do the um, um, Maxwell case, and then we do the direct case, right? And then we'll see what happens.
I think for the next 12 case, I won't do the whole thing. I just want a little bit of free that it's going to be part of your homework again. So I try to resist the temptation to do your homework for you. <coughs> But the principles are exactly the same, right? So instead of Lorenz scalar uh, and Lorenz covariant, now uh, I'm going to say that it's Lorenz covariant. And covariant just means that they take the same form, the equations take the same form in all uh, inertial frames. So it would turn out for Maxwell, uh, so that was scalar. So for Maxwell, it would turn out to be that the entire action only depends on the first derivative of the uh, gauge potential. So remember that, um, remember that uh, we want, uh, so in fact for Maxwell, let's see. Uh, we know that F mu nu is gauge invariant. So right now I'm trying to emphasize Lorentz invariant, but we also know that uh, electromagnetism is gauge invariant. So if you want to build dynamics out of it, you need to think about building dynamics out of this object, right? So for example, you might guess, oh, maybe it's just, maybe it's just uh, something like that. For example, maybe I have my Lagrangian, it's just something like that. And uh, the answer will be no, it cannot be, because this is not gauge invariant, right? So you need to, you need to invent something that is simultaneously gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant, and so one. So what you can show is that in fact, if you define your Lagrangian to be minus one quarter f, uh, usually people just say f squared, but f squared is just f mu nu, and then f mu nu, right? This is downstairs, this is upstairs, and so this will be Lorentz, uh, <coughs> Lorentz invariant. So like I said, I won't do the whole thing but you can guess what needs to be done, right? So the, the Euler Lagrange equations now look like the following. It will be D, uh, L, and because there's no, uh, F only depends on the first derivative, doesn't depend on A, uh, so it will only depend on the uh, derivative of the scalar field, and you need to take the, the, the divergence of it. So we'll do this. This is the Euler Lagrange for Maxwell. And uh, in your homework, you will show that this gives you the fact divergence of uh, F. So if you want to couple it to a um, current, electric current, how do you do it? So it turns out that uh, you will now need to add to it minus A mu coupled with the current. Okay. Um, and so you might complain. So one thing that you might complain is, hey, this thing doesn't look gauge invariant. I just said we need to do gauge invariant. This A is a standalone A, so how can it be gauge invariant? So I'll come to this in a little bit, but let me, let me just say, that if you do, if you do add, uh, so this is for three Maxwell, and you will get this, you will get this equation. If you add, if J is added, then you find that the Lagrangian will now be one one quarter f squared minus a mu j mu, and then the Euler Lagrange would we'll take the following form, it would be dl d partial mu a nu partial mu equals to dl d a nu. 
right? So there's an A nuclear, there must be an A nuclear. And what you find is that, in fact, in this case, we give you partial mu F mu nu equals to J nu. Okay? Uh, so you can, you can say that, well, of course, uh, I can see it's Lorentz covariant, but let's uh, see uh, from the structure of the fiber Lagrange equations that it doesn't actually matter what the final answer is. Just from this alone, you know that in fact this object is a rank one uh, cancer. Right? So, so let's in fact see that explicitly. Okay? So how do you do that? The same strategy. Right? So partial mu a nu uh, of x, and then you want to convert it to x prime means that you would now contract the two indices with the Jacobians. So dx mu, dx prime alpha, and dx nu, dx prime beta. That will give you partial alpha prime, a beta prime of x. Okay. So this is just calculus. Uh, but of course, for our case, just to remind you guys, this, this corresponds to the Lorentz transformations. Okay? These guys are the Lorentz transformations. But that, that already tells you that the Jacobian of these derivatives, meaning when you transform from one to the other, in fact, it's just a double, I'm sorry, it's just a double Jacobian. It's just dx mu, dx prime alpha, dx nu, dx prime beta. Okay. And then, um, when you then um, look at the derivative uh, you find that what you what you discover is that this is in fact just the contraction of the um, let me just write down first of prime a beta prime d mu d nu d l d l prime a beta prime Right? And this is now um, just a contraction with the Jacobians as we have shown. Dx mu, dx prime alpha, dx nu, dx prime beta, dl. So in fact, you can probably guess what happens when you have higher rank cancer. Right? So in general, uh, if your if L is a Lorentz scalar, I should really say Poincaré scalar, but usually that's what people say. But it is a Poincaré scalar. That's what usually what we demand. Uh, then. Uh, you can see that if you take a derivative with respect to a tensor, uh, a, a, a lower rank tensor, T alpha 1 all the way to alpha n, then by now you can guess what's going to happen. If you go to a different, if you go to a different Lorentz ring, let's say D, T, uh, say mu prime 1 all the way to mu prime n, then all you have to do is just contract dx prime mu 1, dx alpha 1, all the way to dx alpha n, dx prime mu n. So there's a sum over mu 1 through mu n, these guys, uh, but once you contract them, uh, you get the derivative in the x -prim. And this just tells you that the derivative of the Lagrangian Provided it's a scalar with respect to a tensor, uh, 
uh, will give you will give you a, 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 a space-time tensor. Okay. Uh, and that's why when you take the divergence, for example, when you now go ahead and take the divergence of this, uh, the divergence, the derivative itself, itself is a one rank one tensor, but it transforms oppositely uh, to this. So that's why uh, you know that d mu d This guy, in fact, now will transform as a rank one tensor, which means you will take this out, but it will now be dx nu, dx prime beta, and then it will be, this will become beta, and then we'll have alpha, alpha prime, a beta prime. Right, so in other words, after taking one derivative, uh, there will be one free index, and that one free index still transforms as a space-time tensor to so the rank one, rank one guy, and therefore this guy is a rank one tensor equation. Anyway, so so um, so the case of the Dirac equation is a little bit more uh, unusual, just because uh, it's no longer uh, transforming under the usual uh, lambda, not the usual space-time transformation. But otherwise, it's, it's, the spirit is the same. Right. So even though it doesn't transform like. Um, the usual space-time transformation, it transforms under the spin-half representation, the direct uh, left and right that we talked about previously. So, um, let's write that down. Sorry, before I continue, let's talk about this one a little bit. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so gauge invariance. Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about gauge invariance before we, before we uh, write down the direct case right, and see how, how the variational principle that works. Um, there's a subtlety there that I, I need to, I can't find the explanation in Tasty and Schroeder, but I'll tell you guys what, what it is. But okay, let's talk about this case first. Gauge 
variables has an intimate relation with the patient variables. There we go again. We can complain about markers. Um, Gaitian variance. Oh, this is going to be part of the <laughs> Marcus. Gaitian variance. Invariance. Is related to current conservation. I don't want to say it implies each other, but uh, it's tied to each other. And here's how you can see it. Right? So this is clearly gauge and variant. But uh, let's look at this term. Uh, and and remem let's remember also that this occurs inside an integral. Okay. And so under a gauge transformation, you would shift a mu by a gradient. Okay. And so what you see is that you get back the same term plus uh, a gradient, which I can integrate by parts. And so I get a mu j mu minus uh, lambda times the divergence of the carbon. You see? So the gauge, the if if J were not conserved, then this term, I'm assuming that when I integrate by parts, the surface term can be thrown away. Right? So this is something that we almost always assume. Um, and this is safe in lambda. You choose a lambda uh, that falls off to zero at infinity. Right? So this is usually what we assume. Uh, and, and then you just get a shift in the term shift by a term that is the diversion to J. And in that case, you see that uh, is an if and only if statement. Uh, a, uh, the coupling between, the coupling between A and J uh, is gauge invariant. If and only if. the divergence of J is zero, i.e. current is conserved. Right. So what seems to be a technical, uh, somewhat abstract symmetry, the right? gauge invariance, it's a little bit abstract, right? what does it mean? So, uh, you can see it's tied to something very physical. Uh, the conservation of current, right? So this is something that uh, is worth remembering. Uh, so, so even though gauge invariance itself might appear to be um, somewhat hard to uh, uh, understand intuitively, um, it is in fact tied to something physically very important, which is that of current conservation. You don't want your current not to be so, right, doesn't make, uh, yeah, that, that's breaking, that's breaking something pretty, pretty bad. So, in fact, that's what we're going to assume. If J just shows up here alone, then you want to assume that uh, J, at least that on, so, so I should say, uh, uh, J is, at least when J is conserved uh, on shell. So what on shelf just means? Uh, on shelf just means. Sometimes I throw these jargon around because that's what people in field theory say. On shelf just means uh, J satisfies its own equation of motion. Okay, because J doesn't just come out of nowhere. J has its own dynamics. It is an electron. It will uh, obey the direct equation. If it is something else, it will obey its own equations of motions. So 
uh, the current conservation uh, really just needs to hold at a level where the uh, current satisfies its own equations of motion. Right. You'll see another example of this um, later on. Um, yeah. So is yep. different in each step to choose a, a new J because in physical, in physics, uh, the current conservation will not be valid, isn't it? Say, say your question again. Uh, I mean, what you're saying sounds all correct, but what, what is your question? Uh, so, uh, in some, I mean, the partial mu J mu definitely is not, not be uh, violated uh, in physics problems. Yeah, you don't want it to be violated. That's good. Yeah, but but my statement here is just saying that if you violate it, then you're violating uh, gauge invariance as well. And if you violate gauge invariance, uh, you, you you end up violating current conservation. Uh, in, 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 yeah, yeah. Because in this case, it, because in this case, that's the only term then. That's what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, but in general, if your question is in general, do we allow for uh, current non-conservation? The answer is no. Right? Uh, people can, actually people test such things. The conservation of charge. This corresponds to conservation of charge. Right? People do test such things, and I think uh, I forgot what the bounds are now. But but it's a it's a tested something that's well tested. Just like Lorentz invariance is also well tested. Right? So unless there's a very good reason, you, you don't want to you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to you don't want to break current conservation. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Okay. Good. Okay. So now, so that's a brief remark about gauge invariance. Maybe I'll say more as we do more, but because we're doing E and M, I should at least mention this. So the, the other the remaining thing we should do um, is. Uh, net, uh, direct, right? Because we've done all these uh, theories and we should now know how to. Uh, we already seen all the equations in motion, but uh, now. Oh, we should wait, wait, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Like, where we start the. I mean, start getting better on the yeah. line interval. Coming in, sorry. Why do we start with. Getting better on the line interval. Line interval? Uh, the interval from the line right. Line integral. Sorry, no, I don't don't understand. This one? Are you talking about this one? Yeah. Okay. Why we start with a gauge invariant action? Yeah. Gauge invariant action would imply that the uh, equations of motion are also gauge invariant. Okay. Uh, so this one there is the action of the That that's right, of A mu. Yeah. Yeah, so I, d I don't care about J right now. But later on you can ask, if your question is, how do you know when I vary J, I will get a gauge invariant A, right? And that, that's exactly the, po the point. Yeah. When, when you vary J and you get an equation of motion for itself, you will find that the whole thing is still gauge invariant, provided that it is conserved. Yeah, so, so, come to, so, so later on we'll write down the full action for uh, QED, oh, excuse me, and then um, let's ask the same question again. But but again, the, the main principle here is that if you want whatever thing you want your whatever symmetry you want your um, equations of motion to respect, you first start from an action that is invariant under that same symmetry. Then the claim is that the the equations of motion will respect that symmetry. Either it will be invariant under that symmetry or it will be covariant under that symmetry transformation. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I didn't prove the case for gauge invariant, but it is an assertion. Right? Uh, but, but all I'm proving here, all I'm proving here is that if you want a gauge invariant action, here's how you would do it. Right? You will make sure that your J is conserved. Yes, so go ahead. Before, when we talk about the, uh, the 
main vector of the electron that I mean we, we have to say that we can do shift uh, the A by gradient that's right. uh, homogeneous solution and equation. Yeah, that's for the remember that's for the free photon. That's for the free photon, right? So the more general case would be that um, uh, it would it would not be true. That would be true for the free photon. Yeah. So so that, that's important to realize that um, uh, yeah, you see, I'm going to complete my, my marker yet again, because I, I don't, I cannot erase my own. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so it's important to remember that uh, what I said earlier, that I can do this uh, uh, with, this is true, um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, for Lorentz gauge, uh, let, me, let me correct myself. What I mean, this is true in the Lorentz gauge. This is Lorentz gauge preserving. That's what I was saying. Because you can see that if the left hand side it has diversion zero, the right hand side is also diversion zero. So this is also zero. And so both are Lorentz gauge. In other words, the Lorentz gauge doesn't fix A uh, uniquely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, I don't think that's similar between these two. Uh, no, yeah, so what I want to say is that, yeah, so, so let me continue. So, so this is just specific to preserving the Lorentz gauge. That thing doesn't assume, I haven't even fixed a gauge at all. Right? I haven't even fixed a gauge at all. I'm just saying that uh, if you want the action to be uh, gauge integrated, then you would demand that the, cons the, the, the current better be conserved. Right? Yeah. So it's nothing to do with the choice of gauge itself. But that one is. Right? That one I've already fixed in Lorenz gauge. And uh, I'm showing you that uh, even though I fix the gauge, it doesn't pin down the solution uniquely. That's the issue that, which is a different issue from here. But this issue is about the action, whether or not I fix the gauge yet, how do I make sure the action is gauge in the Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, what did I say? Direct equation, right? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's see, how much time do I have? Okay, good. So probably in 10 minutes we should be able to finish the direct equation. Uh, and we have more. So the, the so the discussion of symmetries as you um, if there's anything you learn from this course is that symmetry is extremely important. Right? You keep hearing me say the word symmetry. So even if you forget everything, what is quantum? When someone asks you what is quantum field theory, symmetry, other than that. <laughs> So this is the four component Dirac split up. And then it would depend on the first derivative of psi. And, and uh, uh, one thing to, to, to note is that because it's complex, right, so far the scalar and the uh, uh, vector potential we're dealing with are real. Uh, and so each component is just one real number. But actually, it also depends on the complex conjugate. Right, so very often I'll just write it as psi dagger and the derivative of psi dagger. Depends on how you write it, but let me write it in uh, two slightly different forms and I'll tell you which one is the more common one. So the more common one to write uh, the direct uh, spin-up is in this form. I'll, I'll, I'll explain the symbols when, after I write, it, write them down. So psi bar, I 
partial slash minus n sine. Okay. Now, but you will find that this is not permission. Uh, this is not um, yeah, it's not permission. So the the more the more uh, permission looking form, which I'm going to call L prime, is the following. The derivative term is the one that is a little bit of a um, is the problem here. So so the first term is psi bar i over two partial psi psi, and then the other term is you can now write uh, i over two partial mu acting on psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay. So so you can probably guess what's happening if you integrate by parts. So remember that the Lagrangian shows up inside an integral. Um, when you integrate by parts this guy, then it will now act on psi, and these two terms will combine to give you this one. But this term now uh, is is uh, real, whereas this term is actually not real. It's not permission. But if you promote it to an operator, it's not permission. But it's okay because it's not permission up to a total uh, <coughs> derivative, which doesn't affect the equations of motion. But uh, I want to show you that these two, you, you might see these two different points in the literature, okay? Um, but, so now I should explain this funny looking sidebar here. So remember that the direct matrices, uh, there are four of them. So mu uh, runs from zero to three. And so sidebar means the following. You take, you take the four components spin up, you take the dagger of it, so now it's a, a row, and then you multiply it by gamma zero. Okay? So for example, sine bar psi means what? You take psi dagger, gamma zero, and then you multiply it by psi. So this is in fact a scalar. Okay? So if you think of this as a comma, this is a four by four matrix. In fact, gamma zero, if you remember, is just one, two by two, one on the off diagonal, and then zero on the diagonals. Okay, so it's a block uh, identity here, block identity here. Um, but in any case, so this is column, this is a four by four matrix, this is a four by four component row. So when you multiply them together, you get just a scalar. Right? And in fact, it's not just a, scale, a matrix. It's not just a one by one matrix uh, scalar. It's, it is, in fact, a uh, uh, Lorentz scalar. So the way to, to remember this is that uh, in the, the way you see it, in fact, is uh, the following. So remember that we the way we built up the direct equation was not directly using the direct matrices and the Clifford algebra and so on, uh, although that's the more common way textbooks do it. But rather, because it's more fundamental to do, to do so, we did it through um, the left and the right-handed SL2C representation. Right, so let me just write that down to remind you guys. So it's I times sigma bar uh, dotted into a derivative uh, acting on the left-handed guy. Uh, uh, actually, now I should do the following. So I'm going to cha change my notation. So previously, we defined psi to be left-handed spinner and then right-handed spinner. So this becomes four components. So now I'm going to change this guy into left-handed and right-handed. Okay, but so lambda is now psi left, rho is psi right. That's what you would find in Pascal and Schroeder, for example. Okay, and so that now I'm going to write it in the following way. This is left-handed equals to mass times right-handed, and then you have i sigma dot partial right-handed equals to uh, mass times left-handed. Okay, so I've already noted that. The fact that this needs to be the same number is the consequence of parity invariance. Right? So 
uh, uh, so this whole thing is not only Lorenz invariance, uh, Lorenz covariant, it's also parity invariant, right? Uh, I didn't have the time to talk about time reversal, but but uh, you can show that it also respects time reversal. But um, how do you write down the question is now? How do you write down the the action for this guy? So it turns out that the action for this guy looks like this. It's actually psi L, uh, psi L, uh, yeah, that's what it's, uh, psi L dagger, I sigma bar dot partial psi L, okay, and then uh, plus psi right dagger, I sigma dot partial psi right, so if I don't have a mass, if my fermions don't have a mass, then these guys would, in fact, my claim is that, let me call this sun L double prime, uh, this in fact will give you the two uncoupled wild equations for massless fermions, okay? And uh, in fact, you can show, if you remember how these guys transform, uh, you can show that uh, this is in fact uh, Lorentz invariant. So this is Lorentz invariant, and this is also Lorentz invariant. If you look back at the notes, how these guys transform, how this guy transform, you'll find that the way this transform is exactly the opposite of how this L transpose, tra uh, dagger will transform, and likewise how this guy transforms is exactly the opposite of how uh, the right-handed dagger would transform. Uh, um, and so, in fact, uh, you can find, you can show that these two guys are, in fact, uh, 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 Lorentzian here. Now, for the mass term, so if you have a mass term, then you need to add minus m, and then you get left-handed guy would now, in fact, interact with the right-handed guy but it's not enough to have just left and right. You also need to do right and left. And again, from the perspective of the SL2C, you can check again that these, this guy will transform exactly oppositely from this guy, and this guy will transform exactly oppositely from this guy. So this guy, these, all of these guys are again Lorenz and Vega from the perspective of SL2C. You can check directly that this is true, okay? And so all that remains, in fact, is to check, I claim, that action is in fact this guy. So the claim is L prime prime is in fact this L. Okay, how do you see it? Uh, so so uh, let's do it explicitly. Right, so L dagger, so L is uh, psi dagger, I'm sorry, gamma zero, which is one, one, and then you have uh, I slash partial slash, which is I sigma bar dot partial, I sigma dot partial, and then minus M, minus M is an identity matrix, so it's minus M here. And then all of that is acting on psi. And I will write it explicitly as psi L psi right. And then uh, this guy is psi L psi right. There I go. And all it takes is just multiplication. Right? So let's do it over here. And then I'll let you guys go. So this is now equals to the following. This is now, let's multiply the matrices first. So it's psi L dagger, psi R dagger, and then um, uh, it's, uh, it's basically 0 times this, I times this. Uh, and then again, minus M, right? And then this guy is now minus M, and then it's I 
Mazda partial. All acting on side, left, side, right. And then what we have here, we have uh, side, left, dagger, side, right, dagger. And then uh, it's now the dot product, basically. It's now I sigma bar partial acting on side left minus M side right and then minus M side left plus I sigma dot partial acting on side right and now when you write it out what do you have? You have side left dagger I sigma bar dotted into side left and then uh, let me write this and this first plus side right dagger I sigma dot partial side right and then uh, the mass terms minus M side left dagger side right and then side right dagger side left i.e. is equal to L prime okay so so again why am I doing this? I'm doing this because uh, if you remember how, uh, I'm going a little bit fast, but if you remember how the left and right and the guys transform, you should be able to recognize that each individual term here, one, two, three, four, are in fact Lorentz invariant. And in fact, there's also parity and time reversal invariant, although the time part I didn't show. But at least Lorentz invariant should be clear from what we have discussed uh, from SL to C. So um, uh, what I claim is that because this is Lorentz invariant, as long as you can show that this is equal to that, then therefore this is also Lorentz invariant. And that's what we've shown to you. Right? So, so using direct spinners and using direct matrices, we are able to, to rewrite the SL2C left and right handed st stuff in a more compact way. Uh, uh, that shows the Lorentz invariance of the, uh, uh, the action. So what I haven't shown is that actually this gives you the direct equation, right? but I'm out of time, so I'll do it the next time. But I claim that when you vary this appropriately, this or this will give you the direct equation. I haven't shown that, but I'll do that the next time. Any questions? How do we know what the question is? such that the corresponding nodal current is actual electric current. Uh, yeah, so, so good. So I'll come to that in a little bit. So the only internal symmetry I've talked about so far is gauge invariance, right? Um, but uh, remember that electromagnetism is about U1 symmetry. So what we'll discover and what we'll do the next time is to discover that the U1 symmetry, global U1 symmetry, in fact is what generates the conserved number current. And in the electromagnetic case, for the fermionic case, uh, the U1 symmetry actually just generates the conservation of fermion numbers. So number of fermions minus number of anti-fermions must be uh, a constant. Uh, but in the electromagnetic case, uh, you will also discover that that number current is in fact corresponding to the uh, total uh, electric uh, current conservation. Yeah. So, so, so what you learn in undergraduate uh, 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 ENM conservation of current. Uh, now you have the more uh, field theoretic interpretation. It comes about due to U1, global U1 symmetry. And so if you ever break uh, uh, current conservation, you're actually breaking the U1 symmetry of the underlying field theory. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll see that next time, right? Yeah, so so, so we will do, once we are done with, uh, like I said, we're now doing mainly space-time symmetries at the level of the action. Uh, the next thing to do is, in fact, to do internal symmetry and see what what are the how do you construct things that are uh, invariant under whatever internal symmetry. 
and then we'll talk about non-current uh, migration.